thank you very much, uh, Geoffrey. And thank you to everyone who's here in person and also online. I hope that you can now hear us online. I know before you couldn't, but hopefully you can. Um, I've been asked to start with a health warning that we are going to run the format tonight with each of our esteemed speakers addressing their thoughts to you for about 10 minutes, and then they're going to reply to the other one. Um, and then we're going to open the floor for some questions. But I've been asked to make a plea that can you please restrict the questions to questions? Uh, the rule is no more than 30 seconds. You don't need to say who you are or any other comments. If you could just ask questions, that would be really appreciated. After we finish, we are going to have some drinks. And I've told that, been told that both the speakers will be tethered to the table, so you can go and ask them if you don't have time. But we're really hoping, also, if you're online, I've got um, an iPad in front of me, so hopefully I'll also go to some questions that are on this screen. Um, but I hope you're all looking forward to this evening's seminar as much as I am. There can scarcely be few topics of, of such interest um, to everyone. And we are incredibly fortunate tonight to have two really uh, esteemed speakers. Um, first of all, we have Kay Firth Butterfield. She is CEO of Good Tech Advisory. And she is one of just four 2024 Time Magazine Impact Awardees for her work on responsible AI since um, 2011. That's how ahead of the curve she is. Um, please go and look it up online. She sent me the link to it. Uh, and it's something really, really special. Um, she's the former inaugural head of AI at the World Economic Forum. And she really is one of the foremost experts in the world on the governance of AI. She's also a barrister, a former professor, a technologist, and an entrepreneur who has an abiding interest in how humanity can equitably benefit from new technologies, especially AI. Now, she's an associate barrister at Doughty Street. She's a master of Inner Temple. And she served on the Lord Chief Justice's advisory panel on AI and the law. I'm not quite sure how she has time to sleep because she also <laughs> co-founded Responsible AI Institute. In 2014, she was the world's first chief AI ethics officer, the vice chair of the IEEE, Global Initiative for Ethical Considerations in Artificial Intelligence <laughs> and Autonomous Systems for seven years. She was also part of a group which, which met at, I'm going to say this wrong, Aziz Lomar, um, and she can probably explain what that is, the, the ethical principles. Um, she's on the Polaris Council for the Government Accountability Office, USA, advisory board of the Aboyets Data Innovation, the advisory board for UNESCO on AI, and AI for All. Um, so I, I think you can see she is truly an expert in this field. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that she was featured in the New York Times as one of 10 women changing the landscape of leadership in 2021. Secondly, we have uh, Robert Buckland, again, who probably needs little introduction to you. But he um, was called to the bar at Inner Temple in 1991. And he spent nearly 20 years in practice specialising in criminal litigation. He was a member of the um, Attorney General's List of Prosecuting Counsel from 1999 to 2010. And he was appointed a part-time Crown Court Circuit Judge in 2009. He started his political career in 1987 in the general election. He was a constituency campaign manager then. And in 2010, he was elected uh, as an MP for South Swindon, and he's been re-elected three times since then. He joined the UK government as Solicitor General in 2014, and then um, in May 2019, he became Minister of State for Prisons and Probation. July 2019, he was the Lord Chancellor, and he served there till September 2021. 
And then in July 22, he returned to the Cabinet as the Secretary of State for Wales, where he served until October 2022. And the bit that's really relevant to tonight is that in 2023 and 2024, uh, Roberts is the senior fellow at the Mosavar Romani Centre for Business and Government at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, so I'm going to start off with um, Kay, if you might uh, start. Old habits as a barrister die hard. I have to stand up to speak. Um, so it's wonderful to be here today. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for including this topic of AI in this lecture series. Um, it, AI will transform our lives as we know, both individually and societally, in ways that we know now and in ways that we can't actually imagine. But will it be for good? And I will posit the, the concept that actually in many countries, it will be the lawyers and judges and regulators in whose hands this decision, will it be for good, lies. It will also be in the hands of um, lawyers in companies and ethics officers, responsible AI ethics officers in companies. There are pivotal decisions to be made now, which will shape our future and that of our children and beyond. There are important societal questions to be asked and solved now. So we don't wake up in 2045 thinking, oh, I wish we'd planned for this, and I don't like this outcome very much at all. So lots to cover, and ten, only 10 minutes or so to do so. So, put simply, we need to work out now if we humans want to fly the plane, as they do in Star Trek and Star Wars, they obviously made a decision at some stage, <laughs> or... Do we want to hand it all over to AI? Is AI our helper augmenting our work or does it take over? And how much of our work does it take over? And different societies will have different answers. For example, a society with a coffin-shaped population, which is the UK, the shoulders being the number of old people compared to the number of young people down at the foot end, may want more AI carers, for example, for old people. Or maybe they'll choose to have more people immigrate into the country to provide, to provide that work. These are real societal and legal issues that I think we need to be wrestling with now. In the absence of regulation in many jurisdictions, the future with AI is being left to judges, regulators, lawyers. And they'll be at the forefront of AI transformation. So you should really be ready now to understand your role and shape it. Indeed, the absence of regulation specific to AI in the UK means it'll be your advocacy and the courts which will shape our relationship with AI. Despite efforts of the IEEE, the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, the OECD, GPA, and many others, there is no global governance of AI in sight. However, there are existing treaties that can inform our work. So, various human rights, international human rights documents, the Geneva Convention can be used when we think about lethal autonomous weapons and whether to use them and whether we need humans in the loop or on the loop. And the use of AI in space. There are treaties about that. Although, of course, there aren't very many for commercial use and exploration in space. 
various national governments and states have introduced their own legislation. And that was caused what looks like a patchwork of, um, of legislation. So the EU is about to have major legislation across the EU. And any of you practicing with the EU or advising companies um, that work with the EU really need to be on top of that. Brazil is going to have legislation about AI. Many states in the United States have their own legislation about AI, but the federal government doesn't. The UK has the Online Harms Act, and some countries have, in, have introduced non-binding directives. That's, for example, the Biden executive order. And yet others have mandated their existing regulators to deal with new issues, the UK and Australia being examples of that. And in the US, the US regulators have taken up that call with determination. So the FTC has done an enormous amount of work around AI and how it affects business. So for example, they um, mandated that a shareholder in both the Disney Corporation and um, Apple, who wanted to know how much use of AI was in that company and how it was being used, um, actually could put that question in a shareholders meeting. So the activist shareholder, uh, we saw that in regard to climate change. Maybe we're going to see it in regard to AI. And the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has taken to suing people who use AI to hire on the same basis that it would if you used people to hire and they discriminated. So we then have courts which at the moment are most notably dealing with copyright cases. And the major societal impact of whether AI should be trained on data regardless of copyright, or whether some of the richest companies in the world should pay for such a resource. And I think it's important to note that, for example, Spotify and Netflix pay for their copyrighted content. The societal and legal discussion is essentially, do we have innovation responsibly? And is that better than no innovation at all? Many are afraid of losing e out economically. And there's a real societal problem when a country's economy is growing very slowly. Which brings me to the hype and the reality. I was in Davos in January and everything was AI, <coughs> everything. There is so much hype, so many people are trying to sell you AI. But in my experience um, with uh, many, many companies around the world, we're generally at the proof of concept stage. Obviously there are some um, who are well beyond that. So let's look at some of the protections that I think that the existing law already affords if I look at, you know, what is responsible AI? Well, good procurement, both good procurement by governments and also by companies. I think, you know, we can deal with some of the things like accountability and fairness by good procurement. Discrimination. In AI, we call it bias, but in, 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 uh, as lawyers, you know discrimination when you see it. You know it in employment law. You know it in um, gender and, and race uh, contexts. Jobs, hiring in jobs. Um, again, you know that discrimination. Online harms and deep fakes. In Australia, the e-commissioner has done a lot of work thinking about deep fakes and pornography and has actually successfully brought some pro prosecutions in that area. Criminal law, I'll leave Robert to talk more about this, but punishing people who steal, we understand that as lawyers. And so um, 
in, there was a recent case with a poor guy in a bank in Hong Kong who um, was asked to cut a check for $25 million. And he said, no, I can't do that. And so the CFO, CFO said, well, let's have a video conference. They had a video conference. Everyone but the guy who had to cut the check was a deep fake in that video conference. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just plain theft for us lawyers. It was, so what we're seeing is different ways um, that we repeat the same problems that we faced before. Children and other vulnerable adults. I do think that that's an area where we have good law, but we need better law. The FCC in America has been thinking about deep fix as well. And uh, as you probably know, the, for example, um, there was a deep fake of President Biden phoning up everybody in New Hampshire to say, don't bother voting in the primaries. It's all right. Don't bother voting. And so the FCC has used the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, which dates back to 1991, to ban that behavior. So not just celebrity, faking the celebrity voices or the president's voice, but also families. And we know that you know a lot of these people are scamming families by phoning up and saying, I need some money, mom or dad. And then we get to text to video, text to video, and SOMA, the new text to video of um, OpenAI, which isn't released yet. But we need to continue being vigilant about how we use these tools. And my favorite story at the moment on that is the uh, ant video, which you may have seen. The ant's only got four legs. I don't think ants. We have four <laughs> so fortunately, there is an alliance which is led by Adobe called the Content Authenticity Initiative, which focuses on systems to provide context and history for digital media. Knowing that something has been faked, pictures have been faked, is absolutely crucial as we move forward, for example, into our elections this year, um, where over 50% of the world's population by GDP will actually vote. Having talked about today, I just want to take us back to 1817, when Jane Austen's protagonist, Anne Elliot, in Persuasion, said to the man she was arguing with that she wouldn't call into aid books when she defended women's emotions, because they're all written by men. Well, we had a data problem then, and I would argue that we still have the same data problem. For example, our daughter's a pilot in the US Air Force. Only about 6.5% of pilots are women, and only about 3% are fighter pilots. My daughter's data as a female military pilot is overwhelmed by that of her male colleagues, both when it comes to the flying, but perhaps more importantly when it comes to the healthcare in the case of injury. If we're really to succeed in creating a better economic prospect for everyone with AI, we have to do better with data. About three billion people can't access the internet. Put that against the about 180 million people who use a open AI monthly. Billions more have not actually created a sufficiently large data footprint that their contribution is actually elevated in generative AI systems, unless you use really careful prompts. The bulk of data on heart attacks is from white American guys over 55. In fact, just the same as when Anne Elliott was talking, the majority of data is from white men. 
based in the global north. And I don't say that pejoratively, it's just that all you white guys, you've had the pen longer than the rest of us. And so, of course, there's more data mm. that's been created by you. I hear you saying, well, that's just how the world works, isn't it? But I feel that the potential and peril of AI is that it can take us to a new way of thinking about our world, a new way of including everyone. And so we really need to start now. Indeed, next year, it's estimated that we will produce more data every 15 minutes than has ever been created before. So we really need to address this problem now. It'll be part human created and part AI created. That's what we call AI cannibalism, where AI creates the data it then falls back into the, into the data lake of generative AI, and then it's used by AI again. If we're not careful, it's, it will further marginalize women and minorities, and I don't think that's the society we want. So what place does the law have to play? Well, again, the FTC in America is trying to prevent companies changing their terms and conditions to harvest yet more data. We have far to go. I truly hope that we can all come together and make AI a safe and equitable tool for everyone to advance humanity as well as our economy. Maybe we can do that. But you as lawyers, judges and regulators, as lawyers in companies, are going to be at the forefront. So let's talk some more about it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'll give the floor to Robert. Now. Thank you very much indeed. And I will time order to just Experience. Right, okay, let's start again. Very good. Well, look, thank you very much uh, to Inner Temple for uh, allowing me to be uh, a wholly inadequate stand in for my great friend Jeremy Wright. But it's a huge pleasure to, to um, play second house to Kay, who uh, I know uh, and respect and admire uh, in so many ways. And she's uh, helped set the context and set the scene for what it is that I think we should be talking about tonight. And when she was talking about Soma, I kept on thinking about Aldous Huxley. I don't know about you. Remember that the drug in Brave New World was, of course, called Soma. Um, I'm sure that's a, an unintentional uh, slip by the uh, manufacturers of this new product. But still, uh, for those of us who are literary minded, uh, it does perhaps start this lecture on a somewhat sinister tone, which I don't intend it to be at all, because my basic thesis is that um, machine learning uh, will be an incredible tool to us, but it has to be a partner of our labours, the co-pilot, if you like, ultimately helping the human decision maker, the human advisor, to come to a conclusion in an efficient, safe, ethical uh, uh, and just way. And to actually advance access to justice to corners of our society and corners of our human activity to which, uh, like the Ritz, it is currently open to all. And when I was thinking of uh, Kay's uh, allusions to Jane Austen, I remembered Persuasion was probably the most exciting book she ever wrote because my recollection of that is that it's centred around Lyme Regis and there's a wonderful wall called the Cobb at Lyme Regis which is designed to protect the beautiful town. It's still there now from the ravages of the tide and the sea. A, a, a defensive rail, if you like. Uh, not dissimilar to the sort of issue we're talking about. What I remember about that book is that Louisa, I think, put her faith in Captain Townsend and fell off the wall and died because she trusted uh, in his uh, ability to catch her. Um, and perhaps it's that question of trust uh, and that uh, human assumption that everything's going to be all right, which frankly isn't going to be good enough when it comes to how we maintain 
regulate and, yes, monitor the use of artificial intelligence. Because I think it's all very well to set rules and principles on, in year one, but unless those data sets are regularly checked and audited to deal with the sort of biases that Kay has been talking about, believe you me, they exist. The evidence is there that uh, use of large language models in particular will entrench bias, in particular racial bias in the criminal justice system. That's what the evidence shows us from the United States and other jurisdictions. Then we've got a problem uh, unless we really audit and cleanse and diversify and sort out the database in the first place. But look, here's some good news. I think in some activities in law and justice, we don't actually need data-based models. And I'm thinking in particular of the sort of judgments that judges and tribunal chairs will have to come to in every day of their working lives, particularly with the proliferation of sentencing guidelines here in England and Wales, and the creation, increasing focus, particularly in crime, but also in other uh, uh, areas of law, family, I think, uh, in, in the sort of decision tree approach to uh, legal judgments. Now, decision trees, I don't think, need populating by data sets because what they should be is entirely free of, of that and focused upon the task in hand, namely, for example, with sentencing guidelines, all the input from the most uh, the recent sentencing guideline that takes the judge through uh, the steps that they have to do, remember, in many, many cases, uh, right through the criminal uh, calendar. So I think at a stroke we can perhaps eliminate some of the genuine legitimate concerns we have about the dangers of unsupervised and unaudited uh, uh, data sets. What am I saying? Well, I'm saying is that the decision tree, I think, the process can be speeded up, which means more cases can be dealt with, dealt with in a quicker way. But at the same time, it still leaves that essential element of human discretion, which I think is the essence of human judgment. Now, without getting too philosophical, uh, for those of you who've got time, please have a look at the first paper I published uh, at Harvard Kennedy School on judges and judgment. I think judgment comes into various categories, two main categories. One, that sort of uh, practical judgment that I've just taken you through, applying sentencing guidelines perhaps using a decision tree model, where a judge is using a fixed framework within which they come to a defined conclusion. And then the other type of judgment, which is reflective judgment, uh, when you're listening to a, a witness, assessing their credibility, working out whether you can rely upon their version of events as opposed to a, another conflicting witness. And of course, where does that become really central? Well, in the work of juries. Let's not forget here... We're not just talking about trained lawyers, we're talking about lay people uh, who come uh, in the form of our jury system. Long may it continue. And it's in that area of reflective judgment that I think we need to start with first principles, which is to hold on to that essential, that indefinable human element that I think um, any form of assistive technology will not be able to fully replicate. I think the first question is, of course, the explicability of judgments and why it is that uh, judges or juries come to their view. I mean, of course, juries never give their reasons. And although there's a school of thought out there that thinks that should change, I'm not part of it. But then the machine uh, uh, is, of course, uh, inscrutable as well, is it not? Now, I'm told that the technology is there that can allow machines to explain why it is they come to uh, conclusions, and that may well be an answer to that conundrum. But I think fundamentally, there still remains a question of public confidence and trust. In other words, whilst we as members of the public might be more than happy for uh, PayPal to resolve our eBay disputes, which is happening in millions of transactions every year, and that's all being done by algorithm, by machine learning, are we going to be so happy if a machine tells us we are losing? Uh, residence of our children or, or contact with our children or we're going to lose our liberty because of a finding of guilt. I think those questions of public trust and confidence will continue to endure uh, for many, many generations to come. Now I'm not going to say that ultimately they will always be the case because I think human nature is such that the more we use technology, the more we use machines, the smartphone for example, the more trusting and confident we become in using them. But then 
that perhaps then exposes some of the dangers that Kay has uh, alluded quite properly to with regard to the extrinsic realities that face us with justice, which is that justice is shaped by the world around it. You know, we don't live in a, in a hermetically sealed process. Justice is the product of the uh, evidence, the material that we all consider, uh, whether we're giving advice as lawyers or making findings of fact or, or law as judges, uh, from uh, the outside world. And when you think that when I started at the bar 30 years ago, uh, a normal case, an assault case, would perhaps be, you know, not much more than a, a few, an inch or two of paper. Uh, now, one is expected to be able to analyse the contents of a smartphone, uh, which we know is the paper equivalent of the Eiffel Tower, to, to, to put it conservat conservatively. Uh, and that's therefore sheer proliferation of extrinsic factors generated uh, in very ma 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 large part by machine means that we as lawyers cannot put our heads in the sand and say everything's fine as it is, thank you very much. The world in 2024, uh, you know, it does not affect the way we do business in the courts. Um, I'm glad that the Judicial College has issued guidance to judges and tribunal chairs about the risks and benefits of various types of AI and indeed has done a good job in defining the different types of artificial intelligence. Um, however, without being disrespectful to the great uh, minds in the Judicial College, I do think that the current list of indications that work may have been produced by AI seems to be very anti-American. Uh, there's a lot of references to um, unfamiliar citations, brackets, sometimes from the US, and submissions, dare I say, that use American spelling, or, horror of horrors, refer to overseas cases. So, judges in the audience, be on your guard. The Americans are coming. Um, look, I think, I think this is a laudable attempt to deal with it, but can I say that I think judges already are with some, I think, good sense and a, and a little... Uh, style dealing uh, with this problem. I, 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 I pray and aid the, uh, the tribunal, the tax tribunal judge, who dealt, I think, very efficiently at the end of last year with Mrs. Harbour and her capital gains tax case, uh, where she was contending that she uh, was not liable for CGT. She was a litigant in person. And she, and the court accepted this, unknowingly generated a number of authorities that didn't exist. They were Figments of the imagination of a large language model, chat, chat GPT-3, I think it was. Uh, there were cases that approximated uh, to the names that uh, Mrs. Harbour was mm -hmm. submitting, but the outcomes of all those cases were entirely the opposite than the ones that she had submitted to the court. And the, and the tribunal judge, I think, did, dealt with it dispassionately and calmly, but took a long time <laughs> to have to deal with the fact that hallucination had been the order of the day. Now, I think it would be tempting for all of us to fold our arms and say hallucinations mean that we should never uh, use large language models. But we know that that, that problem will be cured uh, and that we won't be worrying about that issue uh, in five or even two years' time. Instead, we should be lifting our eyes above the technological limitations Lifting our eyes above this worry about whether your job is going to exist in five years' time, I think that's an absolutely pointless uh, debate to have and actually not the right way to look at it. And instead, focus upon what it is that makes us lawyers and judges, the ethical code that binds us together and sets us apart from just a, a person giving advice, uh, and the role that we are going to continue to have, not just in... in deepening the quality of justice and reaching uh, new material and, frankly, new litigation that just is impossible in terms of current cost and, and capacity, but remembering that this, these tools give us an invaluable opportunity to broaden access to justice for many, many more people. And that's why I think we should be excited about the opportunities that we have. But in that excitement... We must remain very open-eyed about the dangers of bias, the dangers of deep fake, which are probably, you know, wafting around some of our courts now already. People trying it on, uh, making, uh, you know, what seems, uh, uh, what is false seem credible. 
And that's why Kay's message about content authentication and preventative work is, I think, going to be key for all of us in the legal profession and beyond. And I think my final message, because I don't want to eat up too much time, we want to have a discussion, is that all of us, I think, judges, lawyers, all have a responsibility to learn more about this area. Not to be phased by the technology, but to focus upon our ethics, why is, what it is that we do and why, and then with that confidence, engage with the issues that these various types of machine learning now pose to us. And I think if we take uh, AI in that way, then we will find that it will provide us with more opportunities than risks, but at the same time, using our good judgment as lawyers, we should remember that the human element and that par partnership concept should lie at the heart of the way it comes in and is used, both intrinsically in our system and extrinsically as it inevitably influences the material that we as lawyers deal with in our work daily. And I will stop there. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm conscious that we want to allow enough time for questions. If I could give you both a brief opportunity to r respond. Um, I suppose, Kay, thinking about what Robert said, touching on you, he's saying equality of, um, sorry, mm -hmm. broadening access to justice, but does that raise issues of um, having a quality of arms? If you can afford the best tech, is that going to create its own problems? And do you agree with his fundamental sort of thesis that there should be a partnership between humans and machines, or do you see it differently? Oh, definitely it should be a partnership between human and machine. Um, and, you know, if we take, for example, the military, um, uh, the things that I was talking about, you know, should we have um, lethal autonomous weapons that choose their own targets, or should we choose their targets, and should we, should we work out, should we be the person who says, okay, fire? Um, so I think that the benefits of AI are going to be definitely felt by us working in partnership with the machine. Um, I, I think one of the things that does, two things that worry me a little bit about judges using AI, um, one, at the moment, we can explain our judgments. It is actually very hard to get these systems to explain the judgments. Um, and the second is, you know, going back to my daughter, she um, flies a simulator a lot because one of the things that they know is that pilots can over-rely on their AI systems, their, all of the fly-by-wire systems that they have. And, you know, we need to be aware that um, humans tend to say, Oh, well, if the machine says, it must be okay. So we have, to, we have to bear that in mind if we are going to introduce any sort of co-pilot, to use um, Robert's words, into the judicial system. And then I just wanted also to um, answer your question about, is it the companies with the deepest pockets? Um, Undoubtedly, we are seeing a huge amount of lobbying um, on both sides of the Atlantic um, by companies with very deep pockets. But we're also beginning to see some cases come through. So um, just last week, Air Canada um, defended itself by saying that its chatbot, it should not be responsible for its chatbot. It could be responsible for the content on its website, but it wasn't responsible for its chatbot, which was on the website and had given false advice to somebody. Fortunately, the court in Canada said, well, you know, why wouldn't you be responsible for a chatbot that you created and, and put out into the world? Um, but we are beginning to see some of these cases shaping the way that we think about our work with AI. Yeah. And, and, and what do we do about, you know, the, the litigant going to court who has a million dollars at their disposal to buy the best tech versus 
you know, the, the, the litigant in person that Robert was talking about who's, who's creating fake cases of chat GBT. How are we going to address that? Does that create issues? I, undoubtedly, but I'm not sure they're new issues because sadly, we still have, you know, every day we have litigants in person taking on companies that have large pockets. So I'm not sure that it, that it creates any, that, that that creates any more problem. Obviously the problem with um, the wrong cases is one that we've seen on both sides of the Atlantic. And Robert, just thinking about what Kay was saying, mm. um, that there isn't an international system for dealing with yeah. this, do you think there should be? Is that realistic that we'll get to a point where we have a global solution to this, or is that never going to happen? Um, I think it's a counter of despair to say it's never going to happen. I think that we need to make a, um, a, an international guardrail principle-based system happen. And the... Uh, um, the conference that was held, the summit in Bletchley Park in November of last year, which had uh, the EU plus 29 major countries present, from Brazil right through including China, actually, were there, mentions justice in its declaration. I think it's very important that it is in there. Um, I'm pleased it was there because I think it is in this area that probably we, we can make great strides. Now, who are we? Well, first of all, I think the sectors themselves, the legal professions themselves, can uh, uh, do uh, more work in this area. And I think on a sector-to-sector -sector basis, there's nothing stopping the ABA working with our Bar Council of the Law Society and other organisations to come to a common set of principles. And I think already we're starting to see that happening. And I therefore think the dialogue will only increase because it's in, frankly, the interests of uh, um, professional practice to uh, have this um, a common understanding and, if you like, this level playing field. Uh, because certainly if you are working internationally, you need to know uh, what it is that you're dealing with. And then at the administration justice of, uh, the administration of justice level, I think that's where uh, nation states, state actors become very important. But again, I think it needs within those jurisdictions to be primarily led by those that know the judiciary, which is why I think the Judicial College's guidance is a good start. But I think that ultimately... Uh, with uh, recognition of judgments being a fact of our working lives in civil and family, uh, and indeed uh, in crime as well to some extent, then clearly it's that extrinsic issue that should drive, I think, uh, some form of guardrail regulation. Now, I say principles-based because I think we should follow uh, the, um, the adage that if, if this isn't bringing unalloyed harm then I think the need for sort of, uh, you know, criminal-style prescriptive legislation is unnecessary. I think AI brings us benefit. It can be neutral. It can be harmful. Um, but I think ultimately that should lead us down the road of a principles-based approach. Um, as Kay said, we're already seeing this developing. The US, uh, most interesting in Europe, in their latest draft EU regulations, they're putting justice and enforcement, law enforcement in the high-risk category. There are three buckets, high-risk, medium, low-risk. They've decided to put it into high-risk, particularly uh, concerned about facial recognition, which, of course, has been the subject of litigation here in the UK, the South Wales Police case in the Supreme Court, where um, caution was the order of the day, and I think rightly so. Um, so you can see already the contours of what a regulatory framework might look like. Um, I don't think we've got much time, though. I think tempting as it is for us to create a sort of Royal Commission approach to this. Was it Macmillan that said that Royal Commissions take minutes and last years? Yes, I think it was. Um, I think that we need to move much more swiftly. But I think as lawyers, if we're just going to leave it to somebody else to do, I think that's a mistake. I think we all need have a responsibility to get up and start helping to do this. Great. I want to open it to the floor. I don't know if somebody's got a question who's present. I've got a few on the screen, but yes, students first. Sorry, just wait for one sec for the mic. Yeah, I think I find it quite interesting, the concept of you need the humans tend to relying on... Uh, on machines, and that's the problem, for example, in employment law, 
there is the risk of like unfair dismissal happening through the use of artificial intelligence. I mean, we had a scandal that's quite recent that goes far beyond those employment law. Should we then intervene on that to avoid clogging the courts and then starting having tribunals clogged of cases of unfair dismissal due to artificial intelligence not being much regulated in that area? Well, I think that's a really good point. I think we need to intervene now in order to prevent that nightmare from coming about. It's not just an employment law, administrative law. Yeah. You know, my colleagues in government are talking about wonderful ways in which AI can make decisions about benefits, immigration, sort it all out. But I've said, hold on, if I'm challenging that by way of judicial review, what about the duty of candour? Government has a duty of candour to disclose everything that uh, has, uh, upon which it has made its decision because we know the administrative challenge is all about how you got to that decision uh, and the any AI system has to be compatible and explicable, uh, otherwise we are going to hit huge problems of opacity which challenge the fundamental notions of justice. So that's why I think you've answered my question about regulation. That's why I think guardrails are really important. And, and just to add that, that's why I talked about procurement in, in my remarks. You know, procurement the, and really... Um, having a proper procedure for procurement by government of these tools is going to be incredibly important. Yeah, and obviously we've had the post office scandal, which hasn't engendered confidence in that was just a computer system, right? How are we going to prevent that? Well, I mean, that's an old technology. It's ICL Fujitsu technology 25 years ago. But, hey, the principles are eternal. And we've got to ask ourselves, you know, back in... Was it the criminal? It was one of the criminal justice acts of the late 80s where we, and we've all relied upon it, we've used that law in criminal litigation to allow a presumption that the product of, a, of a, an IT system or computer will be accurate. Yeah. Uh, I, I, unless you can rebut that. Now, the problem with the Fujitsu case is that, was that try as they might, defence teams weren't, just a, weren't able to penetrate this, this wall of non disclosure, which you know, begs a huge number of questions. But we've got to work out whether that type of approach is adequate in order to provide safeguards against the, either the failure of AI or, worse still, the misuse of the data sets that go to populate the algorithms. Now, in a country like ours, where I think you know, we're free and fair, we should be able to set up audit trails and transparency standards that mean that we all know what goes in the data sets. But in China, where for the last seven years, more and more consumer cases are being decided by algorithm, who knows what's gone into their data sets? One is entitled to be sceptical if there is opacity. And uh, you know, I, th I think you know, that question of opacity is one that we should all be very alive to as lawyers. And one, sorry, and one thing that um, the, the judges have begun doing in America, led amazingly, uh, this is my state by Texas, um, is just say, the judges saying, um, if you have used generative AI in any of the briefing documents, you must tell us about it. That's a very simple fix um, and doesn't require a great deal of a, a great deal of guide, ra guide rails or regulation. So bear that in mind if you're a judge. Um, great question that's come in from um, those attending remotely. Um, someone asking what would be the ways in which individuals in the legal field may become more aware of AI, the use of AI and its development. Do you have any tips, either of you, for where people might go as a good resource for that? Um, I would say... There, there's, a, there's a guy called Benedict who writes Benedict's newsletter. I would definitely um, subscribe to Benedict's newsletter. And um, so that you catch all the things that might go wrong, mm. um, Gary Marcus writes a newsletter. And I would definitely um, start there. And, and from there, and following the right people on LinkedIn, you will be flooded with all the latest law, all the case law that's happening, all the things that are happening in Europe. And, you know, we, mm. um, Robert was talking about international guardrails. It will be interesting to see whether the European AI Act actually acts as a international law eventually in the same way as GDPR. Um, so we'll see. I think that that's something for you to watch as well. 
Yeah. Uh, at the risk of sounding facetious, have a read of my paper and look at the bibliography. <laughs> that might give you some idea of how I've got to where I am thus far. Uh, but I think Kay's point about the wider context, you know, there's a danger as lawyers. We just look at this as a very dry legal question. Remember that this is an extrinsic issue. So the question about deep fakes in elections is very real and relevant to all our work. Just because it might be in a, in a political context doesn't mean that it could have a, um, a, a direct or an indirect or even a direct relevance to what might confront you in terms of the evidence you're considering or, or, or the, the case that you are preparing. Um, because it's all around us, and therefore understanding that wider context is, I think, where I would start. A lot of uh, very um, you know, respectable academics uh, in our field are, are looking at this. Cass Sunstein over in Harvard Law uh, uh, is writing and thinking and lecturing, I think, in a, in a very engaging way about this. So I'd recommend looking at his work. Um, and then the more you delve in, the more you will find. So don't be afraid. Don't be put off by the fact that uh, generally in mainstream media, this is talked about as some sort of, you know, IT experts field. And you've got to be, you know, uh, a sort of, uh, uh, you know, whiz kid, a Steve Jobs type person or, you know, no, no, this is for all of us. I'm uh, barely literate. I can use a smartphone just about. But I was determined not to be put off by the fact that um, uh, this this was an issue purely for the experts. It's for all of us. Yeah, and indeed someone's put it on the chat, should AI be included in legal studies so that future yes. lawyers are yes. familiar with it? Yes. Obviously, Resounding. contract and talks yes. and equity might start looking a bit out of date without also having an AI uh, module. Absolutely. And, you know, we have already seen um, deep fakes of um, evidence in Alabama. So, you know, this is, all, this, is, this is happening today. This isn't tomorrow's yes. problem. Um, another question here, would AI be an added feature in ADR, ODR? A question I have been asked by clients is, for, particularly for smaller value disputes, why shouldn't a machine decide? Um, you know, why are we spending all this money on it? Here's yeah. my view about this. I think as long as the, is it, the principle of informed consent becomes very useful. I think if you are uh, open and clear with the client about uh, the pluses and the minuses, and the pluses are going to be speed, cost, the minuses might be, uh, um, you know, because it's sort of quick and dirty, it isn't quite as, you haven't had time necessarily to gather together all the material perhaps you would want to in a perfect world. All those, you know, caveats being put in, I think if people are, are making a decision to use uh, AI on the basis of informed consent, I do not have a problem with that. But but it has to be based upon that principle. And I agree with that, but I think informed consent at the moment with the level of public knowledge of AI is going to be actually really hard to acquire. Mm. Yeah. Any questions from here? Thank you. Um, I just have a question about AI and data. Um, do you think that data protection law should be um, adapted to be more strict with um, how AI processes data or a lot more flexible? So you could have issues where AI is being used to process data to understand or learn about a particular group of people, but then it adapts and then starts giving them used in that way yeah well look again Kay will come in on this look I think that's a really important issue because well let's boil it right back down to privilege let's start a lawyer client privilege if you're feeding information confidential information about your client you know you might have said the issue you might have said something really sensitive to you that is private and you want to get advice and you're feeding this into a third party which is what it is are you breaching that confidentiality? You probably are, I think, because the machine will retain and remember and absorb this in a way that could, you know, I think, breach that, that important rule. Therefore, we've got to, if we're going to use this technology, be absolutely sure as practitioners that we are using tools that preserve that, well, if you like, the black box, if you like, or, of privacy and privilege that has to be part of a lawyer client relationship and the same in in court i think the technology is there i mean you know, it, 
digital case management system in Audit Story <coughs> is able to compartmentalize information so that we don't end up inadvertently sharing uh, information that should not be um, disclosed. Um, so we can do it, but we need to think now about all of that. Now, on your point about data protection, um, I certainly think that although the law, you know, the GDPR rules and, and law has, I think, moved in a, in, a, in a welcome way with regard to specific consent, I think that um, it would be, uh, I think only a fool would say that, you know, we shouldn't look at it again carefully in the context, not just of uh, large language models, but generative AI as well. So um, we've got to be alive to these ethical dimensions and data protection is clearly an important one of it, part of that. Yeah, and obviously it moves so quickly that do you think judges are easier, it's easier for them to deal with things that are moving very quickly rather than legislation? Interested in your thoughts on that? What's a better tool? And someone has asked on the questions, do you think common law countries will have an inherent advantage in keeping up with AI innovations over civil law countries? Or will it be so highly regulated that innovation will be slower? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I, I do think that common law um, jurisdictions have an advantage. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I, I also think that um, there is need for all forms of governance. So I don't like to talk about regulation. I like to talk about governance. In some cases, you do need law and you need parliament in our case to make that law. In other cases, it might be that you need really good self-regulation. So, um, you know, uh, companies coming together, setting up their own ethics advisory panels and um, having the whole C-suite involved in understanding the issues and um, understanding also that you can actually make money out of responsible AI. You know, one of the things we hear is, oh, we'll lose money if we do responsible AI, and that's not true. And, and then um, the, having the, the law, the courts there to, to be a backstop for things that go wrong, I think that that's a perfect suite of um, way, remedies for, for AI as we are today. Um, I've noticed someone at the front here had a question. Um, ag again, just picking up while sh the mic gets walked round. To not go as extreme as AI making judgments just yet, what about AI being used for opinion writing? I always remember as a pupil being told, I don't know if it was an apocryphal story of someone deviling an opinion and then not reading it and b being sent out with a joke at the end mm -hmm. to check that that person, whether they were reading it or not. But... Uh, <laughs> And again, any thoughts on that before we come to this question? I, I personally think that we have sort of fairly major issues around that. And obviously one is the hallucinations. But the others, what Robert just talked about, you know, if you're going to use a large language model, you have to be really, to write your opinion, you can have to be really careful about sharing data and anonymizing that data. And there's a, mm. a paper out just today um, that show that says that 55% of people using um, generative AI are giving, are inserting data, personally identifying, uh, as a personally identifiable data into those models, and 44% are putting secret data into yeah. those machines. So. It's about teaching everybody in your company or your law office, but it's also, so, you know, you, we, it, it makes it really hard to say, okay, write me an opinion on this if you're not going to share any of your client's data. Mm. Okay, question at the front. Um, so my, my question is in three parts, but the first one would be directed to Sir Robert. Place. Um, and so it goes, why did you say it's wrong for people to worry about losing their jobs in light of the popularity of AI? And um, the second one is losing jobs, not a real risk for humans. And what could the government do about this risk? I, I think that whilst there are aspects of the AI revolution, for example, generative AI that are 
genuinely new. I think the rest of it is not, you know, the, it falls into the adage, there's nothing new under the sun. And we've been here many times in generations past saying, you know, the Luddites said, oh my God, the machine's going to end our work. You know, work expanded um, and uh, more, more employment was created. The IT revolution of the 80s, everybody said, oh, that'll change the way we do things. We won't be needing uh, teams of people in offices doing anything. Well, on the contrary, it created more work. And my belief is that for lawyers, whilst the nature of our the way in which we work might change and will change, and let's face it, those of us who are long in the tooth, like me, have seen change over the last 30 years that I couldn't have imagined, that there will be uh, more and different types of work available. Uh, and that's why I think the emphasis on AI and machines expanding the range of work available and reaching new audiences and new uh, people who are able to finally access justice means that the role of the lawyer, if anything, will become more important. Uh, and remember that what, what sets us apart, what binds us together, is our adherence to ethics, and not some woolly concept of ethics, something that, is, that we are trained to apply in all of our work. Look at some of the questions that we've asked tonight about confidentiality, about privilege, about uh, making sure that the information we have is, is, is um, not biased and that it is objective and that we are avoiding being deluded by fakery. You know, these are all the questions that lawyers have asked over the generations. We might now be faced with an incredible task, uh, a, a wall, if you like, of information, much of it which will be fake or false. Well, I can't imagine a more important time for a lawyer. I think we will become more important and more pivotal to, to guarding the gate and making sure that we still live in a civilised society. Great. Um, just you. on the chat, um, how can AI be used ethically to improve the accuracy and efficiency of legal research? And should the government regulate this sector or should it be subject to the control of market forces? Any view on that? I'm not sure what they want, what they're saying. Um, well, how, do, how can you use yeah. it for, well, for legal research? Right. So um, should, should, should there right. be okay. guidance okay. on that? Well, look, I, look I, I'm, I'm a massive fan of uh, Bailey and the work that Laurie and everybody did to create that wonderful database that we've all used and, you know, to great effect, it's a wonderful database. But I felt that when I was at MOJ, it was really important that we did create at the uh, National Archive, an authoritative case law um, set. And that's why I thought it was very important that we moved it under the aegis of the Public Records Office, the National Archive, so that we had a state-based database that uh, would then uh, make us adhere to high standards and that would be authoritative and would be safe to use. And therefore, I do think that there is a role for the state in making sure that there is an authoritative and clear and easy to access and safe to use database. Um, mm. But that doesn't rule out innovation, far from it. Mm. May well be that you know the way in which we have to access some of these databases at the moment is a bit clunky. Frankly, it is. You know, it, it is a bit arbitrary. And I don't know about you, but I constantly get surprised by you know using search terms that don't seem to work on day one, but then work perfectly on day three. You know why? Um, is there a better way that we can do that? And I think that's where innovation comes in. So, um, you know, let's, let's, let's allow 100 flowers to bloom. And let's see what system allows us to access this authoritative information in a safe way. So, so for me, as long as the database is, has integrity and quality and is something that we can all recognise as safe, then how we get there and the technology that we use, I think, should be the subject of innovation and competition. And, yeah, and, and, yeah. Sorry, yeah, and just yeah. explainability. If you yes. if you you if you yes. used AI to do your research, just be open about it. You know, it's it, yes. it shouldn't be um, it shouldn't be something to be worried that oh, I used AI and somebody's going to criticise me for doing it. It in fact the use of AI might well have produced a better result for you. Yes, and certainly I've seen systems that are actually used in the States, something called Clearbrief, which you may have come across, Robert, where mm -hmm. judges now can publish their judgments online so you can hyperlink to cases so the public can see all of that. Also, the facility to check 
that the citations from transcripts from cases are accurate or not. So very much this partnership thing of working together. And again, you can input your opponent's brief and the machine checks, rather than a human being having to go through and check every citation against the transcript or check. And they, I think they've got a partnership now with LexisNexis. So again, your point that that's, that focus on cases that don't exist being cited, I think there is going to be a solution for that very, very soon. But again, those are some examples of things that can really enhance. Um, Jeffrey's waving his hand. Five minutes, OK. No, no, I was actually going to ask questions. OK. Oh, no, 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 you can, yeah. Very simple question. Do we know or do we have to decide collectively whether human reasoning and human judgment is better, worse, or about the same as artificial intelligence, reasoning, and judgment, and distinguish between the two, recalling Denning telling magistrates to give their judgments but not their reasons, because their judgments could be right, but their reasoning wrong. Yes, and didn't, uh, Mansfield said that, I think, as well. Yes, he did say that to a, a, somebody who was going out to govern one of our former colonies and said, uh, you're going to make lots of judgment. Never give your reasons. Your reasons will be wrong, but your judgments will be right. Are you hitting upon you know, what has really occupied me in my first paper and got me into this thinking? And I think that uh, large language models, I think the answer is very clear, no, because they don't think. They don't think they're, they're like enormous libraries, uh, you know, encyclopedias of size that you and I couldn't imagine, which sift. That's what they do. They sift. They don't think. Generative AI is another question, and at the moment, I would say probably not. But no. I don't think we can just fold our arms and say there it is. Um, I think, as I alluded to in my in remarks, I think there are other things going on. It's not just about what you think. It's about what other people think about what you think. In other words, confidence. You know, I can relate to you. Right? Jeffrey, you and I, I know, don't agree on everything. Uh, <laughs> but I know that you, you, your judgment will be the product of years of training and experience, and you will come up with a judgment which I might not agree with, but I will respect, because I know it will have been the product of a judicial process, if you like, a, law, a legal process. And uh, So you, you multiply that. Time and time again, and I think we're still in that ballpark. Whether we're always going to be there, I don't know. But, but yeah. I think we need to be honest enough to acknowledge that technology will improve. Although, obviously, human judgment can be fallible. So, yes. again, thinking about a program that someone wrote for traders, yes. where they discovered they made the same mistakes again and again, and it basically set off an alarm when they were trading in the way that they had done that had led to losses. And it, and it basically said, are you sure you want to do this? Because last time you did this, this is how it turned out. So enhancing their judgments and rather than detracting from it. Yeah. Enhancing judgments is, a, is really important. Uh, I sit on the board of a bank. And um, one thing that we have learned is that our loan officers make much better judgments if they make a judgment with the artificial intelligence rather than the artificial intelligence making a judgment or the human by themselves making the judgment. So that augmentation is, is really important. But, you know, to echo Robert's point, large language models just predict the next word. Mm. They look human. They, 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 you get these amazing things out. But truly... They're not, and we're not at that point yet. No. And I think what you're described is what's called a centaur, which those of us who love classical analogy will know exactly what it is, but it's a half person, half animal, yeah. isn't it? And a centaur is what we're really talking about. You know, in computer chess, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, computer and the human will always beat the computer alone, which is interesting. Um, uh, and you know this centaur concept, I think, will be one that that will will inevitably develop. And you said, what else? You said, see, I need an AI to help me now assist in what you just said because you said something really interesting. It got my brain thinking about 
um, um, not, so, not so much Predicting the centaur. Mm. Predicting it, the next. Anyway, why is trying to remember? Lexus yes. AI is coming this year, apparently. This is on the, and the reading list for this event is a great start. Um, I think somebody had a question over here. I don't know. We got the. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know what it was. Can I just say this? Okay. It's a yeah, joke. Yeah, it's a joke. yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So you talked about um, the large language models reflecting whatever. A large language model comes into a bar. The bar tender says, "What are you having?" The large language model says, "What's everybody else having?" And that's exactly how it works. It is mm -hmm. purely reflective. Which Sorry. comes back to Kay's point about the biases in the system being very, very important. Yeah. Yes. Sorry about that. That's quite okay. Um, so this is a combined question for Sir Robert and Kay. Um, how do you foresee, we were talking about governance um, earlier on, so how do you foresee the governance of AI and the role of the legal professionals evolve to mitigate the risks, particularly as we discussed earlier in the realms of bias and fairness. So we talk about children, um, people who are susceptible online, et cetera, et cetera, whilst also maximizing the benefits and adaptation of responsible AI, which is your area K and the governance as well for Sir Robert. Well, I think for me, we are not having a sufficiently wide conversation at the moment. Not enough people come to lectures like this. Um, not enough people who are citizens and should be involved in this conversation are having that conversation, this conversation. And that's why I started my remarks by saying, if we don't start having this conversation today, we will wake up in 2045 which is now the point when Sam Altman is saying we might have artificial general intelligence um, without having made any decisions about what we humans want out of how we use AI. So I think um, my, my point would be we need to have more conversations. We need to, as citizens, talk to our government because of the, you know, there is a social contract between our government and us, but at the moment, we don't know what that looks like with regard to AI. And lawyers have a fundamental place part to play in this because you will be the people who at the moment are bringing the cases to court, are hearing the cases, um, are dealing with the regulators, because in the UK, we are not going to have law from from government or it doesn't look as good. <laughs> yes, right? and I, I think you know, what, what you've asked really has sort of been an encapsulation of what both Kay and I have been trying to, to grapple with all evening. I think the first thing is it, we've got to work out what it is that we want. What do we want? Um, I, think, I think we know in this room that we want a system of justice that is as uh, accessible to as many people as possible in a safe and ethical way. We want justice to continue to be seen to be done. Uh, to use that important adage, uh, and that we want, uh, you know, the existing rules, privilege, and other other rules that are, have developed for very good reasons, to still operate within a new technological dimension. And um, therefore, I do think that it will be for us as lawyers to start spelling out what it is we want to lead initiatives with regard to regulation on a sector by sector basis but also for those responsible for the administration of justice which is the judiciary and the government also to take steps to provide the necessary safeguards and if necessary to legislate uh, to embed that and I'm slightly um, I don't know really want to be optimistic about legislation I mean, <laughs> you know having steered many bills through Parliament <laughs> I mean I still quite have a quite enjoy doing that, but it's not for everybody's taste, and therefore optimism perhaps isn't the right word. But you know, we should be ready to anticipate and to be prepared to bring forward legislation, uh, as we are seeing uh, more generally in other jurisdictions. And you know, as as English and Welsh and Scots and Northern Irish lawyers have done in the past, you know, we're pretty good at leading thinking on this, and that's why the events like this are important. Uh, they give us a chance to focus upon what it is that we want. And that together, 
getting that request clear means that I think we can chart a safe and ethical way forward. Thank you. I'm being told by the human beings that we need to ah. draw things to a close. I'm sure the AI bot, this really is Master Treasurer, I believe, not uh, a deep fake. Well. But we don't know. <laughs> Oh, geez, ex 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 exactly. Um, <laughs> this has been a fascinating evening, and on behalf of the Inn, I want to express our enormous thanks to both our speakers and indeed to our moderator for steering us through a topic which I find one moves very easily. I've got to move? <laughs> right. A topic where one moves quite easily from anxiety to reassurance and back to anxiety again. <laughs> yes. uh, and I felt that um, on a number of occasions this evening. Indeed, I got to a point when, after that very good question about uh, tips of where to find out information, the response came, Gary Marcus writes a newsletter. I put down who says. And uh, likewise, when one, um, that phrase about a partnership with a machine at the heart of partnership law, one can dissolve a partnership. Can one dissolve wow. uh, a partnership with a machine? Uh, and these have all been fascinating things to think about, the benefits and the risks. I know that uh, four or five years ago, I went with a number of judges to an uh, evening at the Royal Society, where the others there were some very eminent scientists discussing this. And we all arrived feeling um, over-concerned about our own employment and that redundancy was on the way. And that began with some of the initial uh, ad addresses. But the more we talked, and this comes back to a point made by Sir Robert Buckland, it did seem to, from what the scientists were saying at the state of the, of the position then th uh, four or five years ago, that the exercise of discretion was something that would be... Uh, difficult to replicate the role of the judge. Perhaps that might put first instance judges in a stronger position than the Court of Appeal, <laughs> who had less of a chance to, to exercise, a, to, to ex, to exercise a, a discretion. But I certainly came away from that feeling uh, rather more reassured. So thank you for all the, the pros and cons that you've uh, given to us. I feel a bit like that unwise judge who... Uh, in response to submissions from doubtless someone like F.E. Smith said he was none the wiser, to which counsel said, yes, none the wiser, but better informed. <laughs> and right. uh, I certainly, and I'm sure everyone here tonight, feels very much better informed on this vital matter. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.